Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking around <laughs> for the last presentation of the day. Uh, mine is going to, again, be a slightly different angle. And actually, I have to thank everyone on this panel for explaining all of the tough stuff that I'm actually going to refer to now and not explain in detail. Um, so my name is Georgia Bullen. I work at the Open Technology Institute, which is a program of the New America Foundation. And the project I'm going to tell you about today is uh, something that we've been working on for the last year in partnership with the Red Hook Initiative. So RHI is a nonprofit focused on creating social change through youth engagement. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Red Hook. Um, I'm not sure how many people are from New York. But it's actually, if you look out those windows where you see the highway cut parallel to this building, it's the neighborhood on the other side. So uh, it's actually sort of, as a result of that, it's had a lot of systemic issues um, related to inequalities within New York City <laughs> um, in, it, for as long as it's been around as a neighborhood. Uh, it's also home to one of the largest NYCHA housing developments called the Red Hook Houses, and they are the primary constituents of the Red Hook Initiative. So now something we've talked about, I've heard a couple people talk about uh, having multiple choices of broadband at home. These people don't have that, right? They recently, they actually only really recently got Verizon as an option for their wired connections in their houses. but. Regardless of having any option, the options are frequently too expensive for most of the population in Red Hook. Uh, this neighborhood also has a lot of industrial sites. It has some parks. And these are some shots as you come across the highway and get into there uh, and walking towards the Red Hook initiative. So adoption right now in Red Hook of digital tools is actually relatively low. And the reason that this project happened at all was actually the Red Hook initiative approached us and we connected them with a graduate student at Parsons named Jonathan Baldwin, who now is an employee of the Open Technology Institute, uh, to start an experiment of setting up a mesh network in this neighborhood and collaboratively designing the installation of the mesh network with the residents in the neighborhood. And the idea, that actually, the, the goals at the onset were to spark civic and community engagement by addressing local needs, interest, and culture to foster trust, interdependence, and reciprocity through the community, uh, to merge digital and physical community spaces, and ensure that people know about MeSH and have software installed before a communication outage occurs. This is a year ago, not two months ago. This was the goals a year ago. So as it turns out, um, and sort of just like these are some key points about the network, and I'll get into more of the details. But the main key points in making this successful were that there were the network anchors for the, for the physical mesh network are trusted community organizations. Um, and this is all built with a solid relationship with technical support from an outside, outside of the community, which is us. <laughs> um, this is really a community-driven process, uh, designing for what they identified as their own needs, um, and therefore enhancing the engagement simply by being such a participatory process. And a big thing that we've been working on is prototyping applications that are designed to work at a local scale for a community. So this really represents a big portion of how we at OTI work. And we've seen this in a number of the uh, neighborhoods and groups that we work with. We also work in Detroit, Philadelphia, and DC. Um, some of our staff members who are in other cities have also worked with their home neighborhoods using our technology. But what we've really found is that creating digital networks is mostly a social process. And this really talks to what Bob had mentioned earlier um, about that this idea of a survivable social network, having a system that is really built around how the social group and infrastructure is there. So here's this technology we have in use, and getting to the question that probably everyone's really interested in um, based on this crowd. But we're mostly using Ubiquiti routers. Uh, we have a couple of like Netgear routers as well, which I forgot to include on here. Um, and we're running Commotion, which is a firmware that OTI is developing. It's an ad hoc mesh networking platform based on OpenWRT and using the OLSRD routing protocol. I'm going to warn you now, if you have questions about these specifics, I highly recommend the website more than me. <laughs> um, I am a technologist at, the OTI, at OTI, but I am not one of the developers. Uh, I work more on the community engagement side. But there's lots of information on the Commotion Wireless website, and I'm happy to connect you to the right people if you have questions about it. So the key point here, though, with mesh networks and with using mesh networks is that they um, don't have the single point of failure that uh, John was mentioning earlier. 
and instead can work with more of the multi-path that um, Roche was talking about. So rather than having this one point that can fail, we have multiple uh, nodes that are all talking to each other, providing multiple routing pathways. And they can be distributed, they're not centralized, and even better, they're self-healing. So if one node goes offline, the network readjusts to deal with the loss of that node. So starting in February of last year, they installed the first node on the <laughs> roof of RHI. You can see it's um, it was a really technical and strong setup. Uh, about a day later, it blew over and they replaced it with a weighted tire to keep it down. <laughs> but um, this is the first one they set up. So it's facing the Red Hook houses. So this is Red Hook Initiative is literally like catty corner to the Red Hook houses. And they, they're really concerned about who's online there and increasing this digital literacy. So you know that's where they're pointed with it. But their terms of service for their internet um, didn't allow them to really spread the internet outside of their walls. So admittedly, yeah, okay, this is outside of their walls, but like not too far. It's just serving that area right around RHI. So this is the first node they set up and it had an internet gateway. It was just one node. Then about a month later, they set up a second mesh node. It's a little bit more stable this time, but this is um, on top of an apartment building called HarperTech that uh, is not in meshable range with RHI, but is a facing a park. So this one, we also, we didn't have an internet gateway to plug in. So instead, we set up a local server, a Guru Plug server, which is a Linux box, um, similar to what Bob was talking about, and uh, set up a landing page where whenever community members log onto the network, they get directed there, and there's an area for them to leave messages for each other and connect. Um, and that was developed through this community process that I was mentioning before. So meanwhile that all these installations are happening, uh, Jonathan, who's <laughs> standing there in the corner of the photo, um, is running community development workshops, getting ideas from all the community members about what they want this network to be for. And some of the concerns and needs that they, uh, that they brought up was access to the internet, period, any, any access of any kind, um, having accountable participation from the other community members. So it was actually really important to them that they knew who else was contributing and talking and, and was part of that network, this friend model, similar to what Bob was talking about. They didn't want people to be anonymous. They wanted to know that it was, you know, it's Tommy that said that thing, right? And I'm gonna go talk to him about that because I know him. Um, and additionally, they wanted access to resources. A, a big thing that comes up a lot for these community members is they don't know how to get to the things that they need. They don't know how to pay their rent or where to go if they can't pay their rent or who to talk to. That information isn't available. There's no place to even post flyers in the Red Hook houses based on NYCHA rules. So there's no physical communication infrastructure that they can have right now, so it's actually really important to have, potentially have something digital that can um, mimic that. Uh, along the same lines, like additional local information. When are businesses open? When are they closed? They don't have that information easy in an easy way to get to. Um, they also stress the importance that it be multilingual and that it be playful and represent their culture. So in doing that, part of what we started to build up was this uh, product that we call Tide Pools, which is an open source tool built using uh, Leaflet.js and MongoDB and um, PHP. And it's, a, uh, it's kind of like Jonathan describes it as, and actually the residents described it as uh, Ushahidi meets The Sims. So it has the playful feel of playing SimCity, but um, it allows you to do things like collaboratively map information and uh, they could put on events and there's time-based information and all this sort of stuff and so people were using it to be able to talk about their neighborhood. So in addition to that, it powers and gives us the ability to create local applications. So I've, in New York, we have the system called MTA's Bus Time, which actually provides an API of information uh, telling you when the next bus is coming based on like how many blocks away it is or how many stops away. And um, Jonathan, in, based on inf information given him from the residents, pulled this in and now there's an app that's available on the local network getting that information from MTA's bus time, focusing on the one bus that is in the neighborhood that is chronically late. So if you go off its schedules, you will be sorrily disappointed on a regular basis. But if you use this tool, you can actually like run out and grab it and not have to stand in the cold on the sidewalk. So where that gets us. Um, End of October, and I'll be quick. <laughs> okay, the uh, Sandy hits, and power is lost in Red Hook. And unfortunately, Red Hook was not as lucky as Lower Manhattan, and did not get power back until after Thanksgiving. 
the Red Hook houses were without power for over three weeks. Uh, so what we found is that I, just because Red Hook Initiative is already a social anchor, people knew a little bit about the fact that this network project was happening. Some people had been involved in these workshops. So people flocked to Red Hook, knowing, just knowing that they would be the social anchor, and then happily found that Red Hook Initiative was one of the few places that did have power through the hurricane. So the, Red, the network was up and running. Um, people came to just be able to send messages. You know, Red Hook had, would have been closed for the day and people were outside just using their phones, trying to get any sort of ability because they were not having the same experience actually that Ted mentioned. Um, SMS was not working. And I had the same experience in Queens. SMS was not working for a lot of us. There was no, every calls were being dropped, text messages weren't being sent. So really the only reliable infrastructure was access to this wireless network. Um, additionally, uh, we had some help show up. Um, FEMA came in through the innovation program and brought a satellite link to be able, because although Red Hook had mm. power initially, they didn't have access to internet. The, the network, the wired network wasn't available to them. But FEMA came in and gave a satellite link, which allowed um, internet to be routed into the network. And amazingly, some doors opened that had been previously closed. So around, down the block, there's an auto body shop that hadn't had any interest in being a part of this mesh network. They didn't see any value to it. But all of a sudden, after the hurricane, they were willing to help. And so they actually allowed us to install a node with help from some volunteers in the Hack DC community and the New York City Mesh community. Um, and this uh, a node went up, and that allowed us to connect that signal through to this main park where most of the relief and recovery organizations were being stationed. So there were trailers set up there. There was hot food being given out there because um, the Mayor Bloomberg actually directed all food trucks to go to places where there wasn't power and give out free food. Um, all of which was happening at this nearby park, the park that you could see from the top of that apartment building, where we had installed a node back in March. So because of that, that self-healing and dynamicness of the network, that internet signal coming from FEMA was able to be routed around to the park, suddenly providing um, Wi-Fi and access to the internet to all of the residents who were in the park, to all of the recovery workers, and really acted as rapidly available infrastructure for everyone. Uh, and since I should wrap up, we also added a feature to be able to text to the map. Um, as I mentioned, text messaging wasn't working super well, but if you could get it through, this would automatically map. And this is using the Tropo API and the Google Geocoding API. Um, those are some pictures of the installations that we were able to do directly after the hurricane. Uh, some of them were running off of uninterruptible power supplies. Um, because the church that's noted here, they didn't have power, but they did allow us to put in the nodes uh, and we were able to run off batteries. And um, so basically, the network went from just being around Red Hook Initiative to being able to turn that corner and cover that whole park in a matter of days because of the flexibility of the mesh platform. And that's uh, OS Larvez of the mesh. And yeah, so lessons learned. The, Key point is to have done the work ahead of time, which really greases the social wheels, because uh, the technology is can be flexible, um, and having that lightweight infrastructure in place. Um, that's it. Thanks. I also I have some printouts of the case study if anyone wants them.